Well, greetings everybody and welcome to Shepherd's Voice Magazine. Brethren, I am a highly unoriginal guy and as what might be seemingly kind of usual now, I'm going to piggyback some of our message today off of what Jim Patterson spoke of in his last message uh, called Aspire Higher. Uh, I'm highly unoriginal, but I'll tell you what Jim brought out in his message is becoming increasingly important uh, as we go forward, brother, and, and it's why I'm going to try to do what I can to kind of pick up where he left off last time. And I say it's important because so many of the COG groups uh, are becoming quite desperate, for lack of a better term, uh, and they're looking for continued and added membership in the face of things like the COVID lockdowns and so forth, and what has transpired in the wake of uh, uh, the, the various protests and so forth that are going on. Uh, these things have diminished weekly attendance, all right? And uh, that's happening if and where services are actually taking, taking place. And, you know, as is the case here, we've been relying on uh, the more recorded messages for our Sabbath messages, just in light of all these things. Now, this is especially true as we head towards the fall feast season, for instance. And what I'm talking about is how the messages have become increasingly more desperate coming from some of the COG groups. Um, so, for instance, as we head into the, the feast season, we start to see this kind of rhetoric being ramped up. See, over decades of holy day keeping, the COGs have become very dependent on the funds that come in during those uh, feast times in a similar fashion to how a jewelry store might become dependent on Christmas or on uh, Valentine's Day to keep them afloat for the rest of the year. It becomes kind of a issue of material sustenance. And uh, perhaps we can dive into that at a, in a later message, but it, it's the fact that people of the faith are having to use their faith at times like this, uh, in times of unrest, in times of uh, lack of mobility. Uh, it really has these groups doubling down on the old playbook, as it were. Uh, and Jim highlighted, among other things, uh, in his last message, such as my status as, you know, possibly being a, a jerk and a half. I mean, I tried to put on my nice shirt and comb my hair again, but, you know, that's okay. Jerk and a half. I don't mind. I don't mind. But he highlighted not only that, but he highlighted an email blast that had come out from the Church of God International. Now, at the time, he didn't name the group who had sent out the email blast. And perhaps you were already aware of who he was referring to. I'll ask you to forgive me as I blot now and again. We're recording this with zero air conditioning and uh, for our American brethren. It's in the 90s here where, uh, in the place where I'm recording and well over 30 degrees centigrade for all of our Canadian brethren. Uh, so it's a little warm in here. I've got my water, got my, my blotter, and hopefully we can m make it through this uh, in, in a, a reasonable amount of time. But as I say, we, we didn't name the group who had uh, sent out that email last week, and as I said, perhaps you were already aware of who, who it was that Jim was referring to. But when Jim and I spoke of it later, we determined that, you know, these guys and a lot of others put this twaddle out there, okay? They put it out there, and they put it out there for the public to consume and for you, the believer, to consume, and they put their name on it. They put their name on it. We didn't have to suss this out in any way. So, we figured that they can't whine about it if we call them out on the twaddle, seeing as they put their name on it. So we're going to try to do a little bit of that today as uh, we expose uh, perhaps some misconceptions that, that we might have. And trust me when I tell you that I agree with Jim in this too, that it is unfortunate. Uh, it is an unfortunate situation where we have to preach against this stuff. 
it, but trust me also when I tell you that if it weren't for the it imminently disastrous and hazardous uh, to people's faith situation that this is and uh, that the, the message that is being uh, promoted in emails like that well believe me if it weren't for that we wouldn't give them the time of day i know why i wouldn't okay and i'm certain that most of them over there in that particular group don't have the time of day for me and that's okay i'm good with it but sadly the truth is is that it's not only these guys that are peddling the falsehoods. It's not just them, brethren. It's 99.9% .9 of the COG groups that echo these teachings. And I'm sorry, but it may make me an outlier, or Jim an outlier, or anyone who doesn't espouse these things an outlier. But we just cannot go down the road that that uh, email was talking about. Uh, you see, in that blast, the CGI was promoting uh, one of their hosts. Uh, and he promotes a message equating the physical and nationally based promises, which he attributes to, to Abraham, which is basically, uh, if you go through the entirety of his message, and he has a five-part message that goes into this stuff that is, that is equally as damaging, uh, it, it's about elitism and entitlement uh, of primarily white North America. And brethren, he equates that with the very salvational gift that is Jesus Christ. He equates it. It's equating it with the salvational promises of Jesus Christ. And brethren, therein lies the problem. That is the problem. You see, we've been through a ton of scriptures lately showing how nothing in this physical world, in terms of governments, money, any uh, of this, any of this physical temporary world, none of it is on par with the riches of our Savior, Christ Jesus. And I stand by that, brethren. Nothing in this world compares with it, can compare with it, nor should ever be equated with it. So there is a warning in this message about what some of the COG groups are putting out there right now. And there is a motivation behind it, brethren. And unfortunately, it has a lot more to do with parting you with your money or from your money than it has to do with enriching your faith or your spiritual life. So that said, there, there's my big negative for the day. That said, it was noted, uh, noted last week that Jim feels that uh, this is a heretical and blasphemous statement that, that had been made. And he said, he talked to his old buddy Darren, old Pastor Purple Shirt. Oh yeah, he talked to me. And he said oh, that I agreed with him. Guess what? I want to confirm that. I do agree with him. I concur 100%. And I'll confirm my stance on the issue, and I'll back it up by simply rolling out some scriptural facts today, brethren, and some reference that, the references that are there to encourage us. I want it to encourage us. This is, a Sabbath. this is the Sabbath. I want it to be a good Sabbath, and I want us to come away feeling encouraged. And God willing, this will help us guard against losing our faith to such an obstruction and deception that is presented by not only that group in particular, but find a combination of the alphabet and stick COG behind it. It is amazing the creativity that they come up with with, with all of these. And I, I suppose we're part of it to some, some degree, but uh, you know, from the Church of God International to the Church of God Intergalactic, uh, they mostly have brought about this kind of thinking that we have to uh, focus in on some sort of nationalist uh, identity and recognize it for something that God might take away from us because we've been bad only now. I, I honestly, I can't understand it. But it really doesn't matter which one of the alphabet soup uh, camps you subscribe to, brethren, and it doesn't matter if you enjoy the social context of those groups or any other of the aspects. Um, uh, again, I'll say that pretty well every one of them has a similar take in uh, terms of Western white exceptionalism. I'll say it again, Western white exceptionalism. 
And that will take away from your faith, brethren, and it will challenge your dependence on the security that is Jesus Christ. And it will make you a racist. It's as simple as that. It leads to that and no other place. So, it is distinctly that where uh, that item and that train of thought, uh, this is a distinctly where the difference lives between the faith that these groups subscribe to and a faith that I recognize. And brethren, there was a time I might have made an apology for that, but I won't anymore. I won't apologize for that. Uh, so with that out of the way, I want us to continue and, and see what the scripture actually says about this sort of thing. Because it's not just hinted at. It's actually uh, fairly clearly defined. Now, again, our man Jim noticed, uh, noted last week that he figured it might be a stretch to apply Matthew 21 to this discussion. And I was happy to make a phone call and encourage him. No, this is perfect. That was a, a perfect reference for what we're talking about here. It's perfectly applicable when we consider the role that we're supposed to be playing some 2,000 years or so into the future uh, from, from these writings and far removed from the Levant geographically where a lot of this stuff actually uh, has to do with. So, uh, Matthew 21 and verses 33 to 46 is the parable of the, the vineyard owner. And it has a parallel that I found in Acts 13 and verse 46. So let's start there and see where we go. Um, let's begin by revisiting Matthew 21 and the parable of that vineyard owner. And my point, brethren, in going over this, excuse me, is to highlight that Others are trying to tell you that there is an exclusive hidden, a hidden identity lurking in the U.S. and the U.K. and in Canada and elsewhere. And that if you don't buy into that idea, you're out. You're out. Forget it. You're on the fringe. You're done. You're not part of the, the, the greater body of, of opinion. So my argument, though, is that both the geographical, uh, physical lineage identity, as well as our identity in Christ, the spiritual identity, uh, all of this is addressed in Scripture. This is addressed in Scripture, and, and they don't in any way, except through double talk, through conjecture, eisegesis, and deception for the purpose of gain, point to what was in that email that Jim highlighted last week. There is no other reason. And I, again, I stand by that. So let's break into the passage in Matthew 21. At the point where the vineyard owner, or God, is going to send his son. We're going to kind of jump in there. Jim, read, we went through so much of that last week, we don't need to go over the whole thing again. We'll begin uh, where God is about to send his son. And at this point, the others he had sent, the prophets, and so forth, they've already been killed in one fashion or another. So, as I said, I won't read the entire parable. Rather, I want to zero in on what is being said and how it's written. Because we do tend to read right past some of the, uh, uh, what we might think are simpler details in the text. And that can lead to problems, my friends. So... With that being said, let's jump over to Matthew 21. Let's drop down to verse 37 and let's read. It says, finally, he sent his son to them. And he makes this exclamation, they will respect my son. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So some, uh, trying to usurp somebody's inheritance or what they are truly entitled to in the eyes of God is dangerous ground if we we're going to start meddling there, right, brother? And I, we we're seeing here that God takes this stuff fairly seriously, if I might understate it to a certain degree. Uh, verse 39 says, So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. And killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, Christ asked them, What will he do to those farmers? 
And it's interesting how this is written because this is actually how it happened in real time for Jesus Christ. He was seized. He was arrested. He was seized. He was taken out, uh, thrown out from his people. He was rejected and he was ultimately killed. Uh, so this is an unpleasant and uneasy foretelling or prophecy of events that were going to happen. So they answered him with this in verse 41. He says, he will completely destroy those terrible men. They told him, ah, he will destroy those terrible men and lease his vineyard to other farmers who will give him his fruit at the harvest. So the answer they gave Jesus was an over oversimplifying uh, of the point, if not a complete missing uh, of the point in that regard. Uh, you see, the, viscer uh, the answer was visceral and it wasn't scriptural. But they were partly right in some aspects of it. But Jesus really wanted to zero in on them, how to read or interpret these parables as he brought them to him. He, needed, he wanted some people to understand these things. He needed them to. So uh, Jesus compels them the same way that we're being compelled. He says, look to the scriptures. And he says as much in, in, the, in the following verse. Look at the scriptures. Uh, and for all of the reasons that, that Jim gave in his message, Aspire Higher, last week, what we have been given in terms of teaching and what we have in store for us in the future, brethren, it's sufficient. And I want us to keep that in mind. That was a heavy part of the theme last week, and I want it to remain a part of the theme this week. What we have been given by God, by Jesus Christ, is sufficient and we'll likely see that it's more so it's more than sufficient you see the prophets and the apostles are in those teaching scriptures so ask yourself what could we possibly add what can we possibly add that could enhance our security in christ now, brethren not much from our vantage point i would i would assume and I think I'd be right in that assumption. You see, the faith we em embrace, as opposed to entrap, is sufficient. So Jesus challenged them on their scriptural understanding. Okay? And he does that in verse 42. And he said to them, have you never read the scriptures? Have you never read the scriptures? He's being quite flippant with them here. Have you never read the scriptures? And he's referring to Psalm 118, 22 and 23. And he talks about the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is what the Lord has done. And it is wonderful in our eyes. So again, I'll say it. Jim went into the vast majority of this. So I won't, I won't linger there. But in verse 43... This is where the rubber meets the road, kids. This is really where it gets meaningful in my estimation. Because he says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. Well, that's interesting. Because that says to me that this is where the entitlement ends. This is where the exceptionalism ends. We've gone over uh, the point many times, but it bears repeating, brethren, that God has to benefit first in any transaction or covenant that we have with him. He has to benefit first. And we've shown over and over again that uh, the people God is working with are those who respond to his will by believing in his son, Jesus Christ. And again, it's fairly simple when we think of it in those terms. Jim used a wonderful expression there last week when he said, because God said so, because Jesus said so. Sometimes it is just that easy, brethren. Therefore, those to whom Jesus was speaking, which at this time in Matthew 21 was exclusively a Jewish audience or, or men of Israel, if you will, they were being warned that in the interest of God's fruit, his fruit yield, his return on investment being realized that he was going to uh, make that vineyard, that same vineyard, available to everyone. He was going to make Jesus Christ available to all outside of Israel. In a word, Gentiles! The majority of us that are taking part in this video message today, uh, 
the guy doing the speaking and presumably the people doing the listening. That is the majority of us, brethren. So that they too, exclusively through Jesus Christ, would become blessed. And those are those blessings of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham is the coming of Jesus Christ. That was his offspring in the largest sense, in the broader context. It is, that's how the blessings come, is through Jesus Christ. Abraham and Moses being who the Jews claim their elite status from. Brethren, it's an entitlement that they weren't entitled to, and neither are we. Similarly then, it would be foolish to jump on that bandwagon ourselves and call it security. That would be foolishness, brethren. That would be foolishness because there's no security there. Verse 44, whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it'll shatter or crush him or grind him to dust, as some translations say. And again, our man Jim covered this very, very well. Uh, and the next couple of verses as well. Uh, it, but basically the upshot of it is, is that it, when we trip over Jesus, to trip over Jesus, that's okay. That's okay. Look at it in the book of Isaiah. He's supposed to be a stumbling block to, to certain people. It's okay because when we, when we trip on Jesus, we have the opportunity for closer evaluation and to take responsibility and god willing this will lead to repentance and baptism and so forth this is this is how faith blossoms brethren is running into jesus christ and realizing who we are and where we are in terms of who he is and where he is and that's at the right hand of god never forget that because he he, he rose again and we'll see why that is such a comfort uh, as we move along here. Verse 45, it says, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard, this parab heard, heard his parables, they knew he was speaking about them. They were right about that. They weren't just paranoid. They, he, they knew. And in verse 46 says, Although they were looking for a way to arrest him, they feared the crowds because the people regarded him as a prophet. So they, they kind of knew. And I'll just note how the power structure shudders when Jesus Christ empowers the crowd. And when he empowers a group of individuals by the singular individual, empowering each one of those. And they become stronger in the faith and stronger with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Oh, that makes the power structure shudder, let me tell you. Because it slowly makes them irrelevant and they don't like that they don't like that but again we'll note that christ empowers individuals who make up the body of belief through his wisdom and prophecy and just notice how that scared the temple authority then and it scares church authority now and again, I'll just reiterate that it is our true identity in, in Christ that has true power, brethren. And that kind of power should make that kind of authority shake in its boots. I wouldn't want to be them. So I said there was a parallel to Acts 13. So let's see, where, where does that exist exactly? Let's drop down to verse 44 where... Uh, after Paul and Barnabas, they had been preaching and they had been encouraged by some to continue uh, in the spirit and continue preaching, but they had been shot down by others. And that's kind of where we'll break in in verse 44. It says, the following Sabbath, oh, the Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled. Could you imagine that? The whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord, not the word of a church, not the word of a group, not a word of a business. No, the word of the Lord, the word of God verse 45 but when the jews saw the crowds they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what paul was saying insulting him so distract discredit disavow do all that and this is what they were trying to do in, in their attempt to insult him and to push him off his game and in verse 46 paul and barnabas boldly replied boldly Boldly, they didn't, oh, I'm sorry, we got to tell you something that's going to make you feel kind of bad. Well, 
tough noogies, kids. That's pretty much what he what he had to say. And he, they spoke boldly, and they replied, "It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. And he's talking there about to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. This is backing up what is said in Romans one verse sixteen, and in other places throughout your Bible, you will see. And Jesus Christ said it too that uh, the, the the gospel is given to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile." And here's what he says in verse 46. Since you reject it, he's talking to these temple authority Jews, Pharisees, and those who would follow them. Since you reject it and judge yourselves, they judge themselves by their actions, unworthy of eternal life, we are turning to the Gentiles. And you probably say, Darren, you've read this scripture to us a hundred times. Good. Let's read it a hundred more times, brethren. Since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we are turning to the Gentiles. Not the Gentiles who are actually secretly hidden Israelites. No, we are turning to the Gentiles. Verse 47. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. Remember what Jim said last week? Because God said so. Well, there's some of it. I have made you a light. For the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And in this, Paul is quoting from Isaiah 49 and verse 6, which is almost exclusively, that whole chapter is the voice of Christ in prophetic writing, telling of his coming. And it reads, he said, uh, in verse 6, it says, It is not enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations. And you might say, why, why are you being so condescending, Darren? Why are you talking like that? But th th these other churches are trying to tell you something different. They're trying to tell you something different, brethren. And the Bible is telling you something far different from what they're handing you. I will also make you a light to the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Not just the Levant. This stuff is not limited to the, to the Levant. So in verse 46, Paul notes that it is necessary that he went to the Jews first, as I said, and then to the Gentiles, consistent with Romans 1 and verse 16. And he did this. He had to turn to the Gentiles, not only because that's just what God commanded, but because they would listen and respond, whereas Israel, by and large, at that time, and it remains true today, has rejected. And that includes the farmers of Matthew 21. Okay, brethren? Ask yourself this. Why so much hubbub? about going somewhere other than uh, to, the, to the Jews if the people that Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and Luke and Peter and everybody else were going to were just Israel in disguise on a purely common sense level. And you can challenge mine all day long. But does that make any sense at all? Not to say brethren, of course not. It does not. You see, the point that the point was that for God to ben to benefit, and for Him to benefit by way of His plan, the true promises and blessings of Abraham were going to be shared with the rest of the world. Why? Why? Because there would be a return on investment, and the Scripture says so. There will be fruit. There would be fruit. There would be a response. And as you continue reading, you say, you'll see that the word would spread. The word would spread. So let's continue and, and just see how that takes place. Acts 13, beginning, uh, dropping down now to verse 48. It says, when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord, and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. So those who respond will see the eternal benefit, brethren. That's not just sufficient. That's enormously generous. That is more than sufficient, brethren. 
In verse 49, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. More of that response and the fruit yield that the vineyard owner is looking for. In verse 50, but the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city, and they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. They threw them out. Get out. You don't belong. There's always detractors. There's always deceivers, brethren. Verse 51. But Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium. They left. And the disciples... What happened to the disciples? What happened to these guys at that point? It says they were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Joy and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Matthew 21 would indicate to me that there's a sunset on some of the terms of these covenants, number one, that God has made with Israel and with us, and based on the human failing in the equation, not the other way around. Uh, so for me, that addresses the ge geographical, uh, geographical and the uh, prophetic nature of what we've been talking about. This is in, in that little link between... Matthew 21 and Acts 13. See, if one needs more scriptural evidence uh, that the inheritance uh, to Abraham was, was already realized, the physical inheritance was already realized, I encourage everyone to take a stroll through the book of Joshua. Please, go to the book of Joshua, particularly in chapter 20, uh, where we see the, the, the command uh, to build the three and then six cities as per the uh, prophecy of it and the instruction of it in Deuteronomy 19 takes place. See, here you'll find the scriptural proof that these six, uh, the, it has to do with the sanctuary cities, they were built on the lands given uh, as the inheritance to Abraham and the promises of Moses and all of that. And you'll see that throughout the, uh, uh, that book. You'll see that throughout uh, Joshua. The, the tribes of Israel all had the, the, their lands given to them. And I, invent, I invite our, our viewers to, to read Deuteronomy 21 and 20, 28 and the book of Amos in particular uh, to see how Israel had disobeyed and was indeed cursed and divorced from God. That they were put away and how she was destroyed and spread throughout the nations and how her God was a, a jealous husband and stamped out her memory even even from her own culture, brethren. And we can note that, uh, though, that also inside of those scriptures that God gave a path back for Israel. And that gets uh, dealt with by Paul in the book of Romans. And we can, we can go into that at a later time. We, we've discussed that uh, at length in, in other messages. But we can note that that path back, which was realized, as discussed, with Joshua in the Levant. So right there, there's geography dealt with for sure. Okay, so I'll leave that, that part there. But Jesus Christ was and is the path back for mankind, brethren. Not just Jews, not just Gentiles. Okay? We only come to this through, through Jesus Christ. All who will take up the gift of faith in Christ, brethren. So, the point then would be to dump the extraneous burden some garbage then, wouldn't it? The, the, the bad doctrines that the, we kind of load around with us. That would be the point. So, how is this relevant to now, brethren? Because there's a parallel not only between Matthew 21 and Acts 13, but there's a parallel between what is happening in uh, the church, in, uh, the Thessalonian church in Paul's time and what is being promoted by uh, guys like the one we mentioned at the outset of this message. Something similar to what we'll look at briefly here in 2 Thessalonians 2. And I'll get you to turn over there as we uh, continue here. We've spent a fair amount of time lately in, in the two books of Thessalonians, but we'll continue that today with just a, a short passage here. It says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, and not to be easily upset or troubled either by a prophecy or by a message or by a letter supposedly from us alleging that the day of the Lord has come. Don't let anyone deceive you in this way or in any way 
For that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is re uh, revealed and the man doomed to destruction. All right, brother, there's a lot being said there, obviously, but there were those who were troubling the faith of the folks in the Thessalonian church by telling them then that the kingdom had already come. And you say, what is, what's with that statement? Well, they, had, they were telling them that it had passed them by, that it, they had been left out because they weren't sufficient in these false teachers' eyes, they were a little too Gentile for their liking. And they came, brethren, with this message, in the name of the truth. And that had to be corrected by Paul. And Paul recounts how he and Barnabas had been poorly treated in Philippi, basically because the Jews there didn't want the gospel going or reaching the Gentiles. And I would say that that is similar to now, brethren. There were those calling themselves preachers of the truth who could only see salvation through the lens of physical Israel. And as we said at the outset, brethren, that's a problem. And so much so that they'll destroy your faith through fear, trying to make people believe it. And that's a real shame, brethren. And Paul's, Paul tells us there not to be deceived in this matter, in this manner. Sadly, however, these types of voices are the majority in terms of the underpinnings of the corporate COG uh, ministries and their message. They are telling you and or the prospective uh, member, new attendee, that they or you are going to miss out on that same kingdom if you don't recognize a worldview similar to theirs. That's what they're telling you through this, brethren, through emails like that. It's all a threat to our God-ordained prosperity and security here in this country. Oh, beware of the death panels that come from socialized medicine. What? What? I've lived with socialized medicine my entire life. Never seen a death panel yet. Don't think I'm going to find one. But these guys will have you believe that. You see, this is where I call shenanigans. Shenanigans. Big honking steaming, keep your dirty mitts off my faith. Shenanigans. And I'm serious about this, brethren. And like my man Jim, I don't give a rip if I'm called a jerk or worse for calling it out. I really don't. Paul reassured the Thessalonians about this sort of thing. And we're going to look to this, uh, this, his words today as we end for that same kind of reassurance. And we'll see why here in just a second. You see, he reassured them and he comforted them over this and how it affected their fears and their feelings about those who had already died from among them. And we, we should uh, pay attention to that comfort. You see, when somebody came and told them the kingdom was already here, you missed out. Well, what did that say about all these poor people's families who had come to the belief and people who had perhaps died and they thought were in Christ and now were missed? They, they, these guys were taking a big stab at their faith. And that's what's happening to a lot of the brethren today. So let's end on 2 Thessalonians chapter 4 and we'll begin in verse 13. It says, We do not want you to be uninformed. Now that's a departure from some of the messages that I've heard. Brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And here comes the good part, brethren, verse 15. This is where the conquering of death makes all the difference in the world. Verse 15, for we say this to you by a word from the Lord, from God, the Almighty. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. No one's going to get in ahead of anybody. Not, for, not that way. 
And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's insane. How, how, can we, how can we think otherwise? It's right here. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Christ already rose. So who's coming next? All the dead in Christ. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up. So uh, it, anyone who is actually alive at that time will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Not the words from the United States and Britain in, in prophecy. Not from J.A. Allen's Judas Scepter. No, no, stop again. Keep your dirty mitts off my faith. No one can take from us what has been given to us by Jesus Christ. And this same reassurance and comfort in the fact that no one truly in Christ will ever miss out on any aspect of the kingdom, now or in the future. Well, brethren, that message is for us as much as it was for those hearers in the time of Paul. And verses 16 through 18 are the encouraging words, brethren, that I'm going to leave you with today. And I will leave it there and tell you to please, if you haven't already, hit the uh, follow, subscribe icons and the, the like icon. Give us the thumbs up, if you will. And I'll leave it there. Happy Sabbath. And we'll see you next time on Shepherd's Voice magazine.